Welcome, friends, to another edition of the Chart Book. We got a lot of slides today, so we're going to jump right in and get started. So you can find our research service, theideafarm.com. You guys know my day job is, is managing money, but we send out uh, some of these research pieces. The best research pieces we read every week, usually one to three pieces, some of the top podcasts. Um, but what are we going to talk about today? We're going to talk about a lot. Inflation, Russia, stock market outlooks, pandemics, commodities, all that good stuff. But I want to start with an idea. You guys know I love to do polls on Twitter, but this is a poll that I think is important because uh, it's the, the answer is the inverse, probably what it should be. And the question we asked this often, but this was the end of the year last year. And we said to everyone, do you have a written investing plan? And simple question, uh, but the sad reality is most don't. Now, um, that may or may not be impactful, but for many, it's a problem. Same reason as not having a diet for many people is a problem because maybe your rules are, hey, I'm not going to eat ice cream every day. But if you buy ice cream and leave it in the freezer and then wake up in the middle of the night hungry, you're probably going to go eat ice cream. But if you make the rule where you're not going to have ice cream in the house, well, then that option is not available. The whole point being often as humans uh, that have emotions, those emotions can often drive uh, our, our decisions for, for better or for worse, often for worse, particularly in the investing world. So we always say it's important to have a plan. It could be simple. It doesn't have to be 10 pages long, but, but just a plan in general. And going back to Buffett, um, this is a tweet and I'll read it, but he says, look, people get smarter, but they don't get wiser. They don't get more emotionally stable. All the conditions for extreme overvaluation or undervaluation absolutely exist the way they did 50 years ago. You can teach all you want to the people. You can tell them to read Ben Graham's book. You can send them to graduate school, but when they're scared, they're scared. You know, and I think, um, look, we just got, hopefully, I can't say got through, but are, are making our way through a, a global pandemic. It was exhausting. Uh, we then now find ourselves early this year in uh, an invasion slash, uh, you know, war scenario in Europe. Can't we just have a quiet quarter? That's all I'm asking. Three months, just just a quiet three months. But that's the reality of of life and the way it has been for the past hundred years. Um, so some of the things we're going to talk about today are inherently non consensus. Uh, you guys know a lot of the the views I hold are, are not uh, consensus in the investing space, and we have an entire thread of seventeen tweets I keep adding to about views I hold that the vast majority of my peers, meaning seventy five percent plus don't hold. Um, and there's a few in here today, but there's a couple of tweets. Adam Grant has a, a great um, phrase or quote that I can't really get out of my head where he has, uh, and I'll read it. He says, the hallmark of an open mind is not letting your ideas become your identity. And I like to translate a lot of things into the investing world. So a good example would be, you know, stocks outperform bonds. You know, that's sort of the iron law of investing. Everyone believes that. Um, or stocks are going to return zero for the next decade. And then that just defines everything I am. But I think the, you know, the opposite is also true. And, I, and I've kind of been stuck with this in my head where you know, a lot of our identity uh, informs our ideas. Um, you know, think about yourself. What is your gender? What is your race? Um, where did you grow up? What is your religion? And how many of those pre-existing conditions you know, cause you to have certain beliefs about the world? Well, for most of us everywhere, it's, it's a lot of them. Um, and so trying to have an open mind about many of the things we deal with, not just uh, in investing, but in the world, I think is, is really hard to separate, separate yourself uh, from both your ideas or your identity and be able to have an open mind. Cliff is on here. We do our, our daily quote of the day on Twitter. And Cliff says, keep an open mind, but not so open your mind falls out, right? So some of the things I uh, will talk about today are, are going to go against probably your current beliefs, but, but try to be open minded. You know, some of y'all are or crypto blockheads, some of you are gold miners, some of you are dividend guys and gals, you know, some of y'all swear by muni bonds, whatever it is, uh, refuse to invest globally, just just try to have an open mind. And, and um, you know, let's let's question some of our priors. So, um, you know, I was I was joking in the beginning about can't we just have a, a normal market? But what does that even mean? I love to tease the forecasters. Uh, we often say it's it's way better to be uh, Rip Van Winkle than Nostradamus. Uh, meaning, you know, investing and kind of forgetting about it and putting it away versus trying to predict the future. These happen every year where the strategists always come out from all the big banks. And this was uh, from the end of 2020, uh, where Jonathan F uh, Farrow had the list of all the bank uh, 
targets for the S&P, and they range from 3,800 to 4,400. Well, guess where the S&P ended? 40, almost 4,800. And so we have this um, saying, and, I, and I, I think I borrowed this from Ken Fisher. I'm not sure exactly who it was, but said, normal stock market returns are extreme. And what does that mean? Well, most people almost always forecast, hey, the market's going to be up 5 to 10%. And that almost never happens. You know, if you look at the percent of the yearly stock market returns that are greater than 50% or negative, it's 75% of the time. So most of the time things are way high or flat or negative. And so, um, you know, if you look at uh, only, I think one fifth of the time, is it between sort of that, that 10 to, to minus couple percent. So normal markets have this behavior where there are these fat tails. And I think most people at this point fundamentally understand that but it often doesn't play into sort of their behavior and how they, how they invest. Um, so let's start with US stock market, everyone's darling, uh, one of the last remaining um, standing sort of uh, bull markets that has been over the past decade has really stomped everything else. But you know these are facts here in this tweet, so you can't really argue them, but I think it's an interesting perspective because everyone, uh, particularly in the US, wants to put all your money in US stocks. And I just go through these stats, I did this in January, said we're only 5% of the global population, sort of a rounding error, only about 15% of public global companies, a quarter of world GDP, so the biggest, but still only a quarter uh, of the stocks in the world. It's 40% of the global market cap, but the quote you hear most is 60% because a lot of those stocks would be considered uninvestable, maybe state-sponsored companies, et cetera. So 60% um, of the world market cap the average American puts of their stock allocation 80% in US stocks. And then we'd like to talk about this. We do a ranking of all the stocks markets in the world. The US is uh, uh, more expensive than the vast majority of all of them. So, so I like to just put this in context because a lot of people want to put all their money in US stocks, um, but a lot of the other measures of size uh, would certainly have you at, at a much lower allocation. Um, and not only do most people put most of their money in stocks, they put most of their money in U.S. stocks now. So this is a chart from Lynn Alden. Um, she shows equities as a percent of household assets going back to the 1950s. This is the highest we've ever been, uh, which, uh, depending on your perspective, could be amazing or could be trouble. Historically, this chart has a pretty high uh, inverse correlation to future performance over the next decade. Here's a tweet that um, I think got me ratioed where people just started losing their mind. Uh, and I don't know why. I have some ideas, but um, again, it's 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 just facts. So um, I didn't even really present any opinions, um, but I'll read it. You know, historically, you go back 100 years, and this isn't just in the U.S. This is everywhere. Stock markets hate inflation, and we're talking about inflation. And historically, you're in that sort of zero to four percent warm and fuzzy zone where inflation's mild. There's low volatility of inflation. Consumers, companies can, uh, you know, make plans, forecast the future. That's where people award the highest multiples to stocks, and that's true in the data. If you look at the historical average ten-year PE ratio, CAPE ratio, doesn't matter which one you use. We'll get to that in a minute. But let's look at the CAPE ratio. Uh, in normal times, you know, the the, the PE is sort of low twenties, but once it starts ticking up, particularly above four uh, percent, it craters. So historically, when you're above four percent, the, the CAPE ratio goes down to 13 and above 7%, uh, it goes below 10. And a lot of people think those are um, huge tail outcome scenarios, but they're not. They actually happen quite a bit. If I recall, and I'll get this wrong, but it's roughly right. Uh, above 7% inflation happens like 15% of the time and above 4% was like 30. So these are not atypical um, scenarios. When I tweeted this, uh, which was the beginning of the year, Stock market was at a, at a P ratio of almost 40. Um, I think it's down to around 36 now after the sell-off. But I said outside of the last year, the highest valuation multiple ever awarded to the U.S. market when you had above 5% inflation was 23. Again, we have a vastly higher multiple now. Um, is that trouble? Is that problematic? Uh, we'll, we'll get to that in a minute. We talk about other valuation metrics. People, you know, again, they, they focus way too much on the CAPE ratio. We say even if you use dividend um, yield, we got to near lowest dividend yield ever, um, only uh, superseded by the internet bubble. 1% dividend yield, that's rough, man. Can you imagine buying US stocks at a 14%er? That's pretty awesome. Uh, 
And then when people got mad at me about that tweet, I, I said, look, there's multiple, many, many academic studies that reams of research that show that stocks hate inflation. This was a piece that um, was one of my favorite pieces of the year. And I'll show you the zoom in on the chart, which is, uh, this is a Goldman piece, and we'll show you the link after this. But what this shows is they use six different types of PE ratio of measurement. People get so caught up, or, oh, is this future PE? Is this 12 in 12 months? Is this uh, peak PE? Is this Schiller cape ratio? It doesn't matter. Look at these. They all are directionally the same, which is the red dot is the highest in the dot-com bubble. The blue little circle right below the red diamond is the valuations today. And then what are the blue and green columns? Those are the blue is the long-term median PE ratio. And then the green is when inflation is low. Okay, so you can see that in every scenario, people pay a higher PE ratio when inflation is low. And then blue is when inflation is outside of that, uh, the average, it's lower. And so if you showed this with high inflation, it's even worse. So the point being, valuations are high. And um, when inflation, if it stays up here, is a huge negative for the stock market. And so here's the link. If you Google Goldman piloting through, you'll get the PDF. It's also on my tweet from January. Uh, it's the best thing I read this year. It's 100 pages. Some of the conclusions they come to are different than I would, but uh, but it's a great read. This is also in my always annual favorite read of the year, uh, which was a spin out of the Triumph the Optimist, which is my favorite investing book. It's from Credit Suisse. They do a free version. If you Google Credit Suisse Global Investment Returns Yearbook, they put out a yearly update. You should read all 10 for the past decade. Here's a chart they have in the book uh, where they show real bond and stock returns versus various inflation levels going back to 1900. And this is in not just the US, but everywhere. And as you can see, uh, stocks like uh, low inflation, and as it, as it picks up uh, both stocks and bonds, the returns start to fall off a cliff really above that 4% metric. We just printed 7.9 inflation in the US, uh, which you can see stock markets really, really don't like. Um, you know, we, we've been talking last year, really since February 2021, we did a, a thread throughout 2021. You can go find it called What in Tarnation, which is a, a reference to my grandma, my Southern grandma, who would say something's crazy, Lord have mercy, um, similar. But uh, there, there was a lot of craziness last year. You know, many of the high flyers have been uh, pounded since then, but uh, but there was a lot of craziness going on and in many ways still is. But I, I said, um, here's a here's a good exercise, you know, go print out this article, grab a red pen and you just update, cross out all the metrics in the article, update them with values from today. This is an article Warren Buffett on the stock market in uh, late 1999. Um, and uh, you can Google this article or, or Google my piece. Um, and it's worth printing out for perspective because a lot of what he said then certainly rhymes today. Now, we've had numerous tweets and threads over the past five, 10 years. We said, look, here's a bunch of the negatives that are lining up. And last year we had a, a tweet that said something along these lines, said, look, valuation is high. Sentiment is high. Retail is trading, tons of options, getting involved in meme stocks percent of equities as a uh, percent of, of household assets is high on and on, right? All these kind of negatives with stock markets that, however, those are all yellow lights until the trend rolls over. Um, that's like the final boss, right? Until you check off this box, the final boss, it doesn't move to red light scenario. So if you guys are on my email list, you would have gotten this article recently entitled red light. It's also on the blog. Um, but wait, basically what this demonstrates, here's the S&P um, the SPY ETF, uh, the black line, the red line is a 10 month simple moving average going back to our old paper, uh, pre-financial crisis, but it shows, um, the price in this nice uptrend over the past, what is this eight years? And a few times it's dipped below only to come roaring right back. Well, we just crossed it below again. And historically speaking, uh, markets when they're below the long-term trend have lower returns, higher volatility, not a great place to be. Now, if you combine that, and this is an old article we've done many times over the year. We say, let's put the US stock market into a four box quadrant. Cheap, expensive. So we said nothing more complicated than P ratio average up to that time. Is it above or below? Couldn't be simpler. And then uptrend or downtrend. Well, the best market, uh, the best market to be in is a cheap uptrend. Makes sense. Uh, 
you do 17% per year um, uh, compound returns. That's my, my favorite setup, right? Cheap markets and an uptrend. Um, but surprisingly to most, the second best setup is an expensive uptrend, which is where we've been the past handful of years. Uh, it gives you okay returns still. Now, the problem comes when that expensive uptrend flips to an expensive downtrend. And we show that with a very technical poo emoji here, uh, but you get roughly no returns there. And that's the, the sort of, we call it the dark quadrant where we are now, or this red light scenario. Now, um, so US stocks, look, we, we've said this, we think they're going to be a bagel for the next decade, no returns real, uh, or a donut, whatever your preference uh, for daily morning carbs is. Uh, bonds, you know what they're going to do. Bonds are going to give you nominal 2%. I'm rounding up uh, on the 10 year for the next decade. Whether those are real returns of two, zero, or minus five will remain to be seen. But you know, this, this is a really nice chart. And I want to include this in an upcoming post or book that we're working on. It shows 10-year excess returns over cash for 6040. And green was the latest 10-year period, which if isn't the highest period in the entire sample since 1954, it's darn close. And blue was the prior before that, 10 years before that. And then the grays, the spectrum is all the possible outcomes that have happened. And so what you can see is that people have kind of been lulled into this scenario where stocks and bonds, 60-40, had this perfect storm of really perfect markets and performance. Um, but you shouldn't expect that. If anything, you should expect the blue line, but be prepared for the, the line at the bottom, which is a full possibility as well. And if we know anything about markets on the long time horizon, as the good times usually fall the bad and vice versa. Uh, it's it's a hard to time that, but um, it's certainly been uh, almost the case for everything going on in the world. We'll touch on a few of those here in a minute. Um, so what can you do? You know, we say a lot to move away from the uh, market cap weight in the US. So away from something like the S&P to what would be our favorite, the value trade. We've talked a lot about this over the past couple of years. Um, here's a chart from AQR. Now this is actually all, all around the world, but it's pretty darn similar to the US chart. And you can see that values had a nice move since the uh, sort of regime change in 2020, but it's barely come off the top. Um, and then you see sentiment things over the last year, like this is a tweet. I love to, to pick on Wealthfront over the years. Uh, it's not gonna be nearly as much fun to pick on them uh, now that they're UBS, uh, but, um, but tease them because they had a, they just removed value from their portfolios over the past year because they said, well, no longer use the value factor as research suggests, it's no longer as effective as it once was, which is like the most preposterous analysis because obviously something didn't look as good after it's had one of the worst return periods over the past number of years, right? That's like, um, you know, if, if U.S. stocks went down 80% saying we'll never invest in U.S. stocks again because the performance has been poor when you probably have the best U.S. stock forward returns in history. Like it's the exact opposite of what you should be doing. Um, but we talked so much about this last year. If you review some of the old chart books, this was my chart of the year, table of the year last year, which was um, goes back to the 1920s showing the value factor in the US, cheap versus expensive, and said, you know, the, the worst year up till 2020 was 1999, uh, which you can see on the chart, that orange line followed by the best year ever, 2020, uh, excuse me, 2000, after the internet bubble popped, value did fine, expensive stuff got creamed. Um, but then you see that actually 2020 was worse than 1999, which is totally crazy. 2021, it didn't beat 2000, uh, but it had a really great year for value. But the good news is I think there's, there's plenty of room more uh, for value to, to run. So you can find that chart. It's really a great one from uh, Matthias. Uh, these, these are a couple of months outdated, but they just go they were showing some of the craziness going on, number of stocks trading above 10 times sales, price sales ratio median on the S&P. Historically, that is literally one of the dumbest things you could possibly do is buy super expensive stocks. People are attracted to it because one lottery ticket out of 100 may work out. But on average, if you buy a basket of them, it's a really bad uh, portfolio decision. Um, this is a, a chart from GMO showing that uh, over, over time in history. So don't buy the expensive stuff. Um, Jeff's, Jeff's got some great tweets lately. Here's one where um, a lot of the people uh, love to talk about, um, you know, stocks now are okay that they're super expensive, the 10, 20, 30, 50, 100 times sales, because they have actual sales and earnings, unlike the late 90s, uh, 
you know, they said, oh, it was only all about eyeballs. And I said, you know, that's funny because if you look at the top 10 stocks from the late 90s that got creamed, they had tons of revenue, tens and hundreds of billions of dollars. And so there's a, this is a chart they show, here's the top 10 market cap companies from 99. I mean, look at these, these were some of the uh, biggest companies in the world. Lucent, that still gives me P PTSD. Uh, but Walmart, Exxon, Cisco, GE, Microsoft, you know, a number of these companies are still below where they were in 1999, which is crazy. Uh, and goes to show the difference between a business and the stock. Uh, we were just looking at some stocks, you know, recently that have had amazing business performance, whether it's Alibaba um, or other, other of these companies have gone public in the past few years where the business has, has had massive growth. The stock has done poorly, which goes to show you always have to include price and value. Um, and if you fast forward today, here's a lot of the biggest names. This was in 2019. You can see not a lot of carryover from those years. I think only one, let's see, Microsoft. If you look in the 80s, it's probably a lot of Japanese companies, et cetera, et cetera. It's hard to stay the big dog. If you look in prior chart books, we probably talked about investing in the largest market caps, both in the market, but in any sector or country, uh, the single biggest stocks can underperform by about 3% per decade, uh, simply because market cap weight has no tether to valuation and, and the price uh, as it goes up can uh, get more expensive and be a huge drag. It's actually fun to kind of look back in history. Apple's a unique one because um, you know they, their valuation has been reasonable disclosure. We've owned it since 2013 and our oldest fund um, that, that focuses on shareholder yield. But we said, who's gonna become the first $10 trillion company? Because Apple was the first to 1 trillion. It's fun to go back in history and look at the history of um, stocks in the US. So first million dollar company, Bank of North America, $10 million company, Bank of the US, $100 million, New York Central Railroad. And then you get some names that you recognize now. Billion was AT&T, 10 billion GM, 100 billion GE, uh, and a trillion Apple. You can do this globally too. It's pretty fun. Dutch East, Dutch, it's in my Twitter somewhere if you, if you search Dutch, Dutch East India Company. My goodness. Um, Apple is a great case study though, as you think about buying the companies. Just because you're large doesn't mean it has to be a bad investment. Apple uh, famously has been able to grow their earnings and revenue as well as treat shareholders mindfully. Um, a lot of stock screens don't pick them up, however, because they, they screen either on dividends alone or buybacks alone. And Apple has been a great case study because they do both. This is a chart from Wisdom Tree showing um, the largest stocks in the US, uh, uh, dividends and buybacks and shareholder yield, which being the, the culmination of the two. Um, and uh, the low valuation buybacks, uh, meaning the cheap stuff, have a much higher shareholder yield, 6%, versus the high valuation, which is the gray at the top, uh, which is up around a 1.5%, uh, versus the median, which is somewhere in the middle. And this goes to show that historically, this is a similar chart, um, the companies that are buying back stock historically have been cheaper uh, than the ones that are issuing stock. Uh, which are the share diluters. And if you go back to the 70s, there's never been a time in history um, where the share issuers beat the share repurchasers, which is pretty cool. It just goes to show if you treat your shareholders thoughtfully, um, over time, you end up in a better place. This has a correlation with valuation too, because the CEOs tend on average when their stock's cheap to buy it back versus when it's expensive when they do issuance. And it's two sides of the same coin. The problem with a lot of the buyback and dividend strategies is they ignore uh, one side where you do net stock buybacks because you have to include the issuance too. Anyway, um, we were talking about, you know, the, the valuations uh, in private equity land are hidden nosebleed levels. I think this is the highest ever average EBITDA purchase price for uh, LBOs. Uh, we've had a LBO, uh, LBO replication fund filed for many years, but I don't want to launch it until the cycle turns because I don't want to launch this fund and watch it go down 70%, which is what happened in the financial crisis. And so um, I always scratch my head and I, I talk to my private equity and as an extension VC friends and, and wonder why they don't hedge their private holdings. Um, you know, a lot of the uh, highly speculative startups and late stage companies in uh, not just tech, but in the market in general over the last year, you know, we, we tweeted, we said, this may be one of those times when you blink and a lot of these companies are down 40, 60, <clears throat> excuse me, 80%, which has been the case, even though the indexes have been okay, 
I think you're down 10, 20% on, on some of the big indexes, but they're, they're hiding the carnage and, and, um, under the surface and some of the blood. But I said, I always wonder why the VC and PE friends whose cycles are even uh, sort of more exposed to what's going on in the public markets, why they never hedge. Uh, there's been some good research out there. AQR has talked about it. Trend following is a great um, complement to, to VC and PE, but there's, despite both being long volatility portfolios, you don't see a lot of people that do both other than me, <laughs> but, but not a lot of people follow my ideas on that where uh, we, we do both and have a huge allocation to trend following. Um, you know, we talk a lot about global valuations, which is going to lead us into another topic soon. But I said, you know, here's, here's some rule of thumbs. You know, we talked about the PE ratio normalish range is sort of that 17 to 22. Uh, and then as you get higher, 30 is expensive. 40 is like the real bubble territory. I don't think there's any countries in the world that are above 40 today. And then you go below 14 is cheap, below 10, um, blood in the street, sort of massively cheap, um, hopefully not literally. But I did this interesting chart um, recently where I said, of the 45 countries we, we track historically, what percent are at certain, certain valuation levels? And so if you go back to 99, right, um, almost everything was expensive and there wasn't much cheap. That's the red line going up and to the right. If you look at 2009, right, after the financial crisis, Almost everything was cheap and not a lot was super expensive. So they're like polar opposites of each other. Value is really a blunt tool and you want to be kind of in the right galaxy when um, you're at the big turning points. And then today, and this has changed in the last month or two, but was more of a plateau. Most everything was kind of reasonable. There's some really cheap stuff, a sprinkling of expensive, but, but that's where the U.S. is. But a, a more of a normal distribution for those. Oh, I, here's the zoomed in version. Now you guys can pause it and take a look at it uh, if you want. Um, this kind of fit in weird here transition because um, a lot of the foreign and cheap stuff is getting cheaper in 2022. Um, a lot of those markets have been hit by what's going on in Ukraine, uh, which is just so unfathomably sad. Um, it's, it's, it's just uh, it's heartbreaking to see what's going on um in in europe and in russia um but it's having knock-on effects and we'll talk on about some of those from the investing perspective you know the big one being you've seen a huge surge already in inflation and commodity prices that were already on the move up this shows 50 percent rises in oil price see all the red circles where we just hit one currently and said every um 50 rise in oil caused a recession or preceded a recession. Now, not every recession was uh, um, had a 50% rise in oil. So there's one, two in here that, that had other um, causes perhaps or, or coincident indicators, but meaning usually this is a sign of some pretty bad times. You know, look, I, every uh, TV show is showing um, the gas station right down the street from me in Los Angeles that has like $7 gas now. So it's, it's, it's in front of everyone's uh, mind but usually it causes some pretty big problems in, uh, in the economy. And I said, you know, going back to the beginning of this talk, as people were thinking, like, what if the 70s played out again? The 70s were like impossible to invest. Uh, almost any allocation really stunk it up unless you had a decent chunk to real assets like gold and commodities, which most didn't, right? And most don't today. And I said, here's a is assets ranked from best to worst real returns from 73 to 81 toward that high inflation period. You can get it from our global asset allocation book, which is free online. We need to update soon. But if you look at some of these, the top, uh, top four, and those were the only positive returning for that decade, um, it's a lot of things that people probably don't have much allocations to gold, emerging markets, commodities, US small caps, and tips. And at the bottom, with stuff you really didn't want in the 70s, uh, bills and bonds, foreign stocks, REITs, and in, in US stocks. And so um, I'm not saying the 70s are gonna play out again, but it, it's got a, a certain rhyme to it. Now, I love to ask people all the time, you know, how much do they invest in, in certain areas? On the left is real assets. And you can see most people have almost zero allocated to real assets and ditto uh, if, you, if you tease out commodities. I don't know how much most people have today, uh, but the feeling is probably not, not enough. Uh, we had someone ask me on Twitter, I said, Meb, how much do you think is a reasonable amount? And I said, look, personally, um, 
I think you make the case for a strategic allocation to real assets for to be 20%. Uh, 30% for many would be on the high end, but that, that kind of goes towards the Talmud portfolio 2,000 years ago of about a third in real assets. And there's a debate of whether you want to include your house or not. You know, the, the lower net worth end of the spectrum house is a much bigger percentage of your portfolio net worth than the higher end. Um, I said, the reason I said don't include house in this, I said almost no one I ever talked to as investors when they're talking about their portfolio includes the return of their house, right? No one quotes 2022. I say, how'd you do in 2021? So my portfolio is up about 10, you know, 80% of that was my house. Like no one ever says that. They, they mentally bucket it separate. Now, obviously it's a huge determinant depending on your situation, um, but it's also non-diversified and extremely localized and concentrated. So I like the idea of having a global real estate, global commodity and tips exposure uh, you know, because they bounce around at different times uh, as well. And even the real estate exposure, it's not just a single family housing in one town. It gives you data centers, it gives you healthcare, it gives you uh, commercial on and on apartments. Um, but a lot of our trend following models are almost like full boat loaded on real assets. And so the 20 to 20, 20 to 30% strategic allocation, if you look at the Trinity models, we discuss is closer to double that. It's probably up north 40, 50% today, which is really high, uh, but has been a great place to be over the past year. And that was, for a long time, it was base metals and energy, and then more recently, ags, and then more recently, precious metals joined the party too. At the end of February, we did a, a tweet that said, here's a list of the markets that are in an uptrend. And it was, all of them were in a downtrend with the exception of commodities, which isn't, uh, you know, from a macro perspective, uh, a particularly uh, good place to be as far as the economy. And we've been talking about this for a while. Here's JC, old podcast alum. He was talking about copper. Copper now broke out to five uh, for the first time ever. You guys know my, my uh, allocation and struggles with wheat over the years as a farmer, farming family. Um, it just hit the highest level ever. Moonshot it up to like 14, I think, um, and above. It's settled sort of in that low teens number today. Who knows where it's going to be going forward? Russia and Ukraine, obviously huge, um, huge allocator, or huge farming producers of, of wheat. Uh, but these levels are already higher than where we were for the Arab Spring. So um, a, a kind of a tough place to be for many countries, Africa, Middle East, um, that re rely on, on uh, wheat as a big input for food prices, many of which are subsidized. So fingers crossed this doesn't cause uh, you know, famine and, and severe geopolitical issues for, for low-income uh, citizens around the world. But, it, but it's, it's something that uh, certainly is, is a big risk factor. And if you look at, you know, we just had this great podcast with um, Lauren Swinkles, uh, who talks a lot about the global market portfolio. He's done a ton of research, ton of white papers. Y'all can check it out. Um, here's a tweet about sort of the the global portfolio, thinking about it in terms of real estate and commodities and everything else. You can download this online. Um, if you find my tweet, uh, they should have a link to it um, or from Macro Alf. We're going to start to wind down soon. Um, but, you know, as you think about inflation, this is an article we did a few years ago called the Stay Rich Portfolio. And the Stay Rich Portfolio is certainly a non-consensus view. This was during the pandemic. But my thesis was, I said, look, if you look back in history, uh, almost everyone, 99% of people think cash is the safest investment or, or, or T-bills, essentially putting money in the bank. Um, and that may be true on a nominal level, but if you include inflation on a real level, it's certainly not true. Uh, and so if you look back in history, low volatility, but you had a drawdown at one point where you lost half your money. Let that sink in. 50% drawdown, right? Most people, if you ask them, you pull them, say, how much do you think T-bills have lost or bonds? Historically, they'll say like 5% or 10% at the most, but the, the, the answer is 50. And so we demonstrated if you bought the global portfolio, which is GAA, um, and then sprinkled in various levels with some T-bills, what was your real return? What was your volatility and drawdown? And it's fascinating, but by investing that safe money and, and um, in many cases, sprinkling in some T-bills as well, you ended up with a lower drawdown. Uh, volatility might've been a little bit higher, but you're adding one, two, three, four percent of yield or return on that portfolio uh, for a very similar exposure. No one else really does this uh, out there. 
you can take the logical extension to um, corporate balance sheets too. Uh, Michael Saylor is really the only one that incorporates this thinking that I've seen. He comes to a slightly different conclusion than I do, which is he ends up in crypto. I end up uh, and, and we practice what we preach. So we disclose uh, personally and professionally how we do um, our allocations. My personally is how I invest 2022. You can Google it online. My company, our corporate balance sheet currently is half in the Trinity strategies and half in tail risk. Um, so we, uh, we practice what we preach on that investment side too. Um, and so uh, this will be interesting because we wrote this before all this has gone down. If inflation stays up around 7% and bond yields are at zero to two, that's a minus 5% plus return. You're going to have a scenario where people are going to start to invest their safe money because they don't feel safe losing it at the rate that uh, they would here too. All right, we're going to start to wind down. Some quick hits. Um, if you go back to our earlier comment on market stats on the US and you kind of flip them uh, and look at emerging markets, you end up with a totally different outcome. You actually are most of the global population in emerging markets, 85%, half the global public companies, over half the global GDP, about a third of market cap. If you adjust for the free float, it's about 12%. The average US investor allocation is three. So it may as well round to zero. And most of these markets are cheaper in the US and they just got a lot cheaper <laughs> with what's going on in Russia. Russia, uh, which of course we've talked about for years, it's like 90% of the emerging market funds owned it. Um, that position has essentially been written down to zero. Now, I don't think that story is over. I certainly think if you see regime change or um, something happens in Russia, which the prediction markets have about 20%, which seems high to me, feels like only about 10% chance to me, um, but you could have a big rebound there. But, um, you know, the story's happened before in Russia in 1917, they closed their markets. China's happened in the 19, uh, I think it was late 40s. But it looks like old Taleb's Turkey you know, happiness, turkey well-being. So he's talking about tail risk where he's like, first thousand days, turkey's life it just got better and better every day. And then surprise, uh, Thanksgiving dinner. And it looks like the Russia chart on the left as well. You know, a lot of people take this to different conclusions. We could spend an entire two hours talking about divestment, ESG, what markets are investable, what are not. Our friend Perth Toll, another podcast alum, has talked a lot about sorting countries and emerging markets by freedom. Um, and there's a lot of ways you could go with this. So we may have to do an entire another chart book on this topic uh, as, as this unfolds in the coming months. I think you're going to start to see a lot more um, mind space devoted to uh, the challenge of China. You know, Russia as a percentage of the global globe is almost nothing. And um, as a percentage of emerging markets is low, China is a different story. You know, emerging market indices, it's, it's nearly half. Uh, so it's a, it's a, it's a big consideration lump that in with Taiwan too. Um, and a lot of people are going to be thinking about that, uh, as a potential stranded asset. But to me, this goes back to the whole concept of why we do Trinity in the first place, which is what I do, uh, with nearly all my public assets, these strategies, which is a reminder, half global buy and hold, uh, of which half us, half foreign of which tilts towards value and momentum, and it has real assets and then half in trend and trend, as I mentioned, has been loading the boat on. Uh, real assets over the past number of months. And so while Russia is painful, is a tiny position compared to end up owning a bunch of the commodity complex, which balanced out a lot of the geopolitical events. So trying to think through this all ahead of time and come up with a portfolio that reacts, reacts and behaves and doesn't uh, lead you to making emotional decision makings, I think is super important. Doesn't mean it's always going to perform great, but, uh, but certainly in this case, um, it's, I think, a really thoughtful exposure. Um, this is really sad, particularly for people in Russia uh, who are not supportive of the regime and what's going on, because like every country in the world, um, they have massive home country bias. We mentioned in the U.S., which is the gold bar. Um, this is from, from Schwab. You know, we put 80 percent in one country. Well, Russians put 95 percent. So they just saw anyone who has uh, Russian exposure in Russia saw their entire net worth essentially go to zero. Um, but this is bad everywhere. This is a really foolish mistake. There's no one in the world that should be doing this. Uh, investing all your money in your own market is one of the simplest diversification uh, things to do to get away from just one market. Um, and it's really sad to see because you could list about 40 of these <laughs> countries below and say, well, how, how dumb of an idea would this be in history? Uh, if not historically, then potentially in the future too. Um, some quick hits and we're going to wind down. I love talking about 13Fs. Uh, we saw that uh, Baupost, Seth Klarman, one of my favorites, 
had one of his best years in a decade last year. But I, I particularly love the 13 Fs where the names are wonky. Um, so here's here were his top five holdings. You obviously can recognize one of them, maybe two. Um, but I love uh, uh, mining those. You can look back at our old book, Invest with a House, free online to check out some of the top investors in the world and uh, how to think about what the stocks they are they're buying. Um, SPACs is a little follow up from a prior chart book. Loose hold, we talked about into 2020, it said the historical SPAC performance post IPO was around minus 70%. Absolutely atrocious. One of the biggest money incinerators in history. And it seems like uh, a lot of the vintages that we've seen in the last year or two are, uh, are playing along to the playbook there, sadly. 2021, we saw a record number of expletives used on conference calls. I wonder why this is, right? So I said, what the F's up with that? What do you think the number one is, listeners? Maybe maybe leave it in the show notes. <laughs> this might get banned. I thought it was probably BS, uh, but it reminds me of this old famous George Carlin. Uh, Google this if you haven't watched it. Seven words you can't, see on, can't say on TV. Um, one of the things Morningstar has done recently is they added a uh, securities lending. You guys have heard me talk about this ad nauseum over the past few years, said it in some cases it's even more impactful than expense ratio. There's an example. They did about a dozen funds where they returned half a percent to over two percentage points of yield for lending out the securities and uh, returning it to shareholders. Morningstar is now reporting it on fund pages, which um, uh, again can show you a pretty cool feature. Quick summary, y'all. Have a plan. Try to get your emotions out of here. Um, think about diversifying away from U.S. market cap weighted stocks and bonds to perhaps value towards foreign markets, towards cheap markets abroad, even emerging markets, um, real estate and commodities as well uh, to hedge that inflation if it decides to stick around, which it feels like it might. Position sizing matters. So even if you have something blow up like a Russia in your portfolio, um, Make sure it doesn't take you out of the game. Make sure you don't bet all your chips on one on one roll of the dice or turn of the cards. This applies to everything. It doesn't matter if you're gold, crypto, putting all your money in one stock, your employer, all dumb ideas. So uh, position sizing often for the old investors out there who have the scars um, and pros will tell you it's probably more important than um, a lot of the investment thesis uh, for other ideas. Be mindful of your expenses as always, cost, taxes, securities, lending as an idea. You guys hit me up at Meb Faber on Twitter, shoot me an email, mf at cambryinvestments.com. Shoot us uh, some questions while we'll I add to the mailbag, include in future chart books, uh, uh, feedback at the mebfabershow.com. Take a listen to the podcast, download it anywhere podcasts are found, um, and you can check out our uh, day job on anywhere with Cambria as well. Uh, have a safe, healthy, and hopefully peaceful March, everyone, and uh, look back to seeing you guys in April.